Hey folks, just to do a little uh, prepping you for the reading of Treasure Island, uh, I just want to go through a list of some things that I think are helpful. I don't have a physical book here to wave at you, but everything else is, is here and available. So we're going to start by talking about the setting of Treasure Island. Treasure Island is a little different from some of the other books that I've got on the list because it's got a real world setting. Now it's a work of fiction, um, but it's, it's not like a dis... Well, I mean, I guess you could say The Hunger Games happens in the real world. It's just in a, in a future of the real world um, that hasn't occurred yet or that Ender's Game happens in the real world. It's just in a future uh, real world. But, you know, like, this is a historical fiction novel. Uh, it's set in a real time. Um, you'll find that the story opens up in England in the 1700s. Um, it often talks about King George being king. Now there were three King Georges, so which one is it? It's sort of up, up to interpretation. Um, it's certainly before the time of the American Revolution, but it is that general time period, which means um, you want to picture people looking like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or something like that. Um, think about Pirates of the Caribbean. That's, that's essentially the world that we're in here, um, except that it starts out in England, which is a very civilized uh, country as opposed to sort of the pirate dens that you tend to picture um, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, it starts out in England, um, but the setting shifts. We end up with sort of three setting shifts over the course of the story. So the beginning of the story is set in England. Then we have a, a part of the story that's set on the ship as it travels to the Caribbean and to Treasure Island. And then the rest of the story takes place on Treasure Island. And so you have sort of these three scene shifts. And actually the three, three scene shifts uh, sort of correspond to... Um, changes that are going on in the protagonist, Jim Hawkins' life. Um, the narrator, we can talk about the narrator of uh, Treasure Island as well. Um, generally speaking, what you've got is a first-person narrator. Um, and the first-person narrator isn't entirely omniscient, but he knows a lot more than a traditional first-person narrator. Um, instead of, say, like The Hunger Games, where you've got a first-person narrator who is coming at you in the present tenses and the past tense, Jim Hawkins is your narrator. He is the main character of the story, uh, the protagonist, but he's writing this after having lived it. So it's an older Jim Hawkins who's writing the story of his life. So you end up with this... Um, perspective of somebody who's knowledgeable and knows how the whole thing turns out, even though he's limited to only his own understandings. Uh, a footnote, there are three chapters in the book that are, are narrated by Dr. Livesey and um, tell you some things that, that Jim Hawkins is unaware of because he's not present. And so um, you do shift narrators at one point, go into Dr. Livesey's head. He's a much older guy with a higher level of vocabulary, so you actually do see sort of a shift in, in narrative perspective there. Uh, but then we come back to Jim Hawkins, uh, and the vast majority, like there's 34 chapters. Uh, three out of 34 is not a very big number. Uh, so uh, you, you do want to be aware, though, that there's going to be a, a narrative perspective ch change at some point uh, partway through. Uh, the difficulties with this book for you as a reader, I think, are mostly language difficulties. It's it's an old book, so it's got some dated language. There's expressions, there's idioms um, that we don't have anymore. They, they talk about doing things that we don't do anymore. And so there's a little bit of a mental leap to get yourself back in time to this age of pirates and sort of understand what's going on. Speaking of pirates, we also have pirate speak. Yar, matey. Um, you know, sometimes they talk in idioms and expressions that we don't get, especially Long John Silver, um, the pirate leader, he often says things like, your, um, I don't know, pure as gold dust, or, you know, tough as pitch, or, you know, like stuff like that, where you're like, I don't even know what he means there. So it's, it's sometimes worth your while to go back and look things up. Same thing with the uh, dated language with the old idioms. Um, and, and expressions. It's it's worth your while to have dictionary.com open while you're reading so when you run into a word you don't know um, that maybe hinders your understanding of um, a section, you're able to open it up and go look at it and understand what's going on there. Um, also, we've got nautical terms, speaking of things that you should probably look up. If you don't know what a bosun is or what a mate is or what a capstan is or what a forecastle is or, you know, stuff like that, it's all parts of the ship or crew members and their various jobs. And so it's worth your while as well to go and look up some of those things. You also run into some things on Treasure Island where they talk about a stockade or about... 
um, particular kinds of trees or, or things that maybe you're not familiar with. So um, it is a shorter book, uh, but it's an older book and it's got some language issues and it's worth your while to have a dictionary open so that you can make sure that you're getting a clear understanding of what you've read. Um, the protagonist, as I said, of this book is Jim Hawkins. Uh, he is a, a young boy who finds a treasure map and then goes on the adventure of a lifetime. Uh, he's a dynamic character. The, the story is going to follow his hero's journey. It's going to follow his growth from essentially boy to man. And so you want to watch and track um, that progress as, as the story goes on. Um, and that should be pretty straightforward for you as well. Um, there's, there's another important character that you have to track, and that is the antagonist. His name is Long John Silver. Um, is he a dynamic character? You don't, you don't really know. Um, he's, he changes a lot, but is his internal character changing, or is he putting on a show for other characters? He's what we call a morally ambiguous character, because you never know whether he's good or bad. I mean, he's, he's certainly bad. Uh, but he's also got good elements to his character, admirable elements along with the negative elements. And you don't know whether he's playing, um, he's certainly playing other people, but is he playing Jim? Is he playing the narrator? And has he played Jim successfully? And is Jim's assessment of who he is as a character a good and quality one? There's all of these elements that um, make, it, make it complicated and make him ambiguous. He's my favorite character in the story, in case you can't tell. Uh, so you want to pay attention to Long John Silver as well. Um, you know, I've, I've given away a little bit, I guess, saying that he's the antagonist. But any, any reader who is a careful reader knows that from the moment he shows up in the story. Um, so we've got some themes here that I would also like to discuss just to sort of help you understand the, the book and the narrative. These are things that you as a reader want to track, want to think about uh, as you continue reading. Uh, the first, obviously, the book is called Treasure Island. So it's a book about treasure. The antagonist is named Long John Silver. He's got treasure in his last name, right? So it's clearly a book about a treasure hunt. And that treasure obviously represents wealth um, and, and valuables and, and those sorts of things. And so the question, I think, a central question of the entire story is, what is valuable? Uh, what does it mean to be rich? Is it having money? Is it living comfortably? Is it being alive? Is it having honor? I mean, there, there's a lot of questions that cycle around the treasure, and the treasure, even though it's the motivating factor of the story, um, is not really shown in a very positive light. People um, want the money because they're greedy, right? And so track what it means to be wealthy and, and what it means to have value and the effects of greed, how greed impacts people's decision making and ideology and stuff like that. And you'll see how Stevenson develops the theme over the course of the story. Uh, another theme that's really prominent is in this is deception versus trustworthiness. Um, it's really important that you're trustworthy, that you don't lie to people um, because people don't know what to believe. And obviously, this is a theme that's going to focus on both your protagonist, um, Jim Hawkins, and your antagonist, Long John Silver. Um, so it's sort of honesty versus lies, if you will. Uh, you know, how important is having a sense of honor, um, that people believe you're honorable, that you see yourself as honorable? What is it worth betraying your own sense of honor for? Um, there's an inherent contrast in this book, too, uh, between gentlemen, people who are, are born into society and value their honor and sort of follow that knightly code of chivalry, and um, buccaneers or pirates, uh, right? And so we have one set who are sort of men of honor uh, in this old English way, and then we have another set who seem to have no honor, um, no honor among thieves. I don't know if you've ever heard that that statement before. And so um, there's a mutiny on a ship, right? And, and this question of trustworthiness and of honor and 
right and wrong sort of come together in this theme of deception versus um, trustworthiness. So um, pay attention to that. Again, watch Silver and contrast him and his pirates with Dr. Livesey and Captain Smullett and Squire Trelawney and their sense of values, and you'll, you'll get something out of this. Uh, a lot of times, as readers, we get something out of contrast. We as, we as human beings have what I call bilateral symmetry, right? Like we have two eyes and two hands, and we like to contrast things with each other. And so... Often authors do this too, but they do it in sort of a moral way. Uh, just like with two eyes, um, you get depth perception of the world around you as opposed to with one eye when everything would not look like it had depth. You wouldn't see the, the roundness, the contrast, the topography of the world around you. Uh, the, so it is with morality, right? And so by giving us contrasts, uh, authors like Stevenson give us good and bad or trustworthy and not trustworthy uh, and greedy and not greedy. And we see these and we start to form value judgments ourselves as readers. He's not, he's not going to come out and tell you what to think. Uh, he's going to lead you uh, to some conclusions. All right, last couple themes, and then, then we'll call this video quits. Uh, coming of age or loss of innocence. This is a story of Jim Hawkins, a young boy who goes off on an adventure. Um, what does Jim find on the adventure? How does he grow? How does he change? He, he comes of age. All stories that have a young protagonist tend to be coming of age stories uh, in which the protagonist goes on a journey, but the journey is simultaneously a physical journey and a mental emotional journey and so um, Jim goes to find treasure but he ends up finding himself right and that's how these stories go uh, so he finds his courage uh, he transitions from a boy to a man but he also does things that sort of ruin that childish innocence uh, you know look at look at how he acts and what he does and what kind of things change him and how he is changed uh, a good example, you'll run into a scene, and I'm not going to give it away for you, but you're going to run into a scene in which there's an apple barrel, and it's a pivotal scene in the story where a lot of things change for Jim. He gets some knowledge that he didn't have before. Well, knowledge and apples, you say, is this an allusion to the Garden of Eden? Yes, yes it is. Um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, right? And so there's, there's moments in the story like that where Jim goes through transitions and starts to change and starts to grow and starts to develop a more clear picture of the world and the realities around him. And you want to be able to see that and track that through this coming of age theme. Speaking of coming of age, um, Jim Hawkins is not an orphan, but at the beginning of the story, his father is very ill and dies and plays a very small part in his life. And Jim goes through a series of sort of surrogate father figures. Um, there's the doctor, Dr. Livesey. There's also Long John Silver. And so we have a number of people playing sort of father figure to Jim as as a kid in the story. And I think that's interesting too. What does he learn from different fathers? How do they impact him? How does he grow? Um, definitely something you want to look at as you continue to read the story. Lastly, I would say that we have this theme sort of of dreams versus reality. Treasure Island is a dream. The dream of being rich and wealthy beyond you know, the, I guess the dreams of avarice, some of those old sayings. Um, but what is the reality of treasure hunting like? How, how does the dream differ? Uh, same thing could be said of advent for adventures. Everybody wants to go on a grand adventure, but how does, how does the dream of the adventure, the image we all have in our head of the adventure, differ from the reality of what the, the adventure entails? Um, you know, this is a story that at the end, it's an adventure story, sure. Um, pirates and romance and all that kind of stuff that you think about on the high seas, but at what price? Uh, I think that's something that Stevenson is, is trying to put out there for everybody to see. All right, I am going to call this video done. If you have any questions about it, just let me know. I'd be happy to answer them in the comments, but hopefully I've given you some things to think about and consider as you read the story Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Thanks.